I'd like to welcome everybody to our virtual town hall meeting today. We are glad you could come and we hope that you'll find this a very informative meeting. And I will turn it over to Ms. Tammy Story as we begin to show, do our different presentations. All right, um, we're going to have a video. We videoed the clips from our admin team at the um, in-person town hall meeting to get the information out there. Um, in the Zoom, you do have a, a chat box. You can, if you have a question, you can put it in there. And I'm gonna tell you later where you can um, put comments and questions and concerns that we're gonna streamline as far as CARES money goes. So uh, we're gonna start, I'm gonna start by sharing my screens. Good evening. I'm so sorry I'm unable to attend in person tonight, but wanted to give you a brief introduction of the ESSER funds and the CARES and provide kind of a description of each before the principals and directors um, get up and tell you how it's impacted their building. ESSER actually stands for the Elementary and Secondary School Emergency Relief Act. That is the umbrella for the CARES federal funding you hear so much about these days. The early county school system received in fiscal year 20, the CARES 1 to the tune of $900,000. And that was used to offset salaries when we were gonna be experiencing state cuts with the pandemic um, downward turn of the economy. In fiscal year 21, at the beginning, we received CARES 2 and that was 3.5 million. That is where a lot of our school nutrition funding came, for, came from. We put in the CARES 2 budget because so many of the students were, did not have access to their normal school meals during the school day. And it also provided opportunities for the summer feeding program. And then in late fiscal year 21, we received, some people call it CARES 3, but it's technically the American Rescue Plan. And that was, the amount of eight million dollars and that specifically was to address learning loss because the students in early county and across the state were missed so much school because of the pandemic they are definitely behind in reading and math and other subjects so at least 20 percent of that eight million must be spent on learning loss and i'm going to turn it over now to the principals and directors to let them explain how they've addressed learning loss, and what other areas we've used the CARES monies for. Thank you so much. And we do have a feedback form on the internet if you would like to ask questions or stop by the superintendent's office. I will certainly be glad to answer any additional questions that aren't answered tonight. And we thank you for your interest in the school system. I'm Matthew Culliford, the principal at Early County Elementary School. And at the elementary school, we have either adopted or we are continuing a number of programs designed to address learning loss and to improve student achievement. Deficiencies in reading have been an ongoing concern for us prior to the school-related closures in March of 2020. Not surprisingly, those weaknesses have gotten worse for many students because they have missed over 100 days of school these last 18 months. To illustrate the impact of learning loss, at the beginning of the year, we found that 26% of our kindergarten students were below benchmark. Benchmark in this case means where a student should be at certain points of the year. We also found that 53% of our kindergarten students were well below benchmark. 23% of first graders were below benchmark and 50% were well below benchmark. 13% of second graders were below benchmark and 52% were well below benchmark. I share the data for these three grades for this reason. Current kindergarten through second grade students have never had a normal, uninterrupted school year. In fact, they probably think that the way we do school now is normal. But hope is not lost. Through Dibbles, a program we brought back to the elementary school, we are able to track the progress of all students throughout the year. We are building foundational skills in kindergarten and first grade by using a new program called Hegarty that explicitly teaches phonemic awareness to children. In layman's terms, phonemic awareness is the ability to identify the individual sounds in spoken words. Children who struggle with phonemic awareness struggle with learning to read. We are continuing to use Saxon phonics in grades kindergarten through second grade. By the way, phonics is the teaching of letter sound correspondence. 
fourth and fifth grade students continue to use Lexia to measure students' reading skills. We have a few staff members taking part in a two-year training in the science of reading called Letters. Kindergarten and first grade teachers are using happy numbers to teach math. I Learn and Star Math are programs for first through fifth grade students. We have Math Lab and Writing Lab during Connections time for students who need extra support in these areas. We also have intervention teachers who are helping struggling students get the help that they need. Further support is provided during our after school program, which meets on Tuesdays and Thursdays, and summer school, which will be held this coming up summer and that we had last summer. All students in kindergarten through fifth grade have access to Chromebooks each day. Additionally, all students were provided with school supplies at the beginning of the year. Book bags have been provided to students whose parents have requested them. I'll conclude with this. No one chose the hand we've been dealt, but we are all committed to playing the right cards. Thank you. One of the first um, ways that we were directly impacted through CARES funding, we were able to have summer school this past summer and offer um, by curriculum materials for summer school the first year we've actually had a purchase curriculum for all three grades and we currently have after school two days a week and Saturday school one time a month for the first semester and second semester we'll be able to increase that to two Saturdays a month and our children if you talk to them actually say they like Saturdays and after school because they have more individualized attention and time with the teacher and they're able to work specifically on their deficits so um, students enjoy after school and Saturday school and have a real positive attitude when they're here and so we're grateful for that. The next thing that you can see or the next way we've really benefited from CARES is just a plethora of instructional resources we are able to provide. We actually were able to adopt a math curriculum this year for the entire school the first time in a very long time and we were able to purchase um, reading intervention and math intervention material and also um, classroom reader sets that supplement science and also this is the summer school curriculum we were able to use this summer to get students ready for the next grade so we actually worked on acceleration as well as remediation during the summer just in this picture alone there are several ways you can see how our students and teachers immediately benefited from cares the great thing, the first day of school, every student got those supplies that you see pictured. So there's no longer, I don't have a pencil, I need glue, I need scissors, I hadn't had a chance to buy my supplies. It was already provided day one, so we didn't lose any instructional time there. You can see evidence of being one-to-one. -one. And just the, the classroom tables and chairs and the kidney-shaped tables where the students are able to work in small groups and be in closer proximity to the teacher. So those, this picture alone just I cannot tell you um, how thankful our teachers are every day for these materials that you see purchased. Um, next here, we were able to add picnic tables and outdoor games for our courtyard. So we were able to provide greater social distancing. Also outdoor time, we encourage students and teachers to have outdoor classroom activities. And these games are not only used in our PE department, our counselors also use those. Um, if it's to have groups outside. So that is just another um, tangible way that I wanted to show each of you how CARES has benefited us. Instructional coaches and interventionists for the first time in my term as principal, so this is my fifth year, I was able to hire a, a half-time instructional coach, 49% who comes in two days a week and works specifically in ELA, as Dr. Culliford was saying. We really have seen a tremendous um, hate to refer it as learning loss, but maybe learning delay. We were also able to add a math interventionist, which I had not had in my entire time here at the, at the middle school as principal and a reading interventionist. So they go in and supplement the content area teacher each day and provide small group um, instruction specific to the students. And you also see an SEL interventionist, which is a social emotional learning interventionist because our children were at home for quite some time and then were required to learn using a Chromebook and a device and had very little interaction, we've had to reacclimate students back to working together in groups and the formalities of school. And I'm not going to go into too much detail because Ms. Pliny will talk more about the SEL interventionist, 
but she has been a tremendous asset to our school counselors here in our building and also has helped address the mental health needs that we have here in Early County. Nursing supplies, all of our district benefited from those. Our nurse was able to take pictures. We were able to get CPR equipment, updated nursing um, handbooks, wheelchairs, stethoscopes, also an audiometer to test hearing. So just that purchase alone, as you can see, that's a lot of equipment that we would not have been able to purchase otherwise. Um, we were also able to um, supplement our special areas or connections. And again, that would be Dr. Richardson's area. So I'm just gonna highlight over, but between high school and, uh, and middle school, we were able to offer construction. Um, we were able to, again, we, we pulled our funds and we were able to add a band teacher to support the current band teacher we have. And you can see here, in a co-teaching environment, one band instructor is leading the class and the second band instructor is sitting next to the student modeling appropriate behavior of how to play the instrument. Let me talk musical language for a minute. Also in this picture, we were able to purchase some band instruments. Some of our instruments were 30, 40 years old and were beyond repair. Being a Title I school, a lot of our students aren't able to rent or purchase the band instruments. So having band instruments for the students to use at school has been a tremendous help and support for our music program and our music program is continuing to grow. Um, we have agriculture as well and we were able to purchase some agricultural um, materials and tools. And most importantly, well not most importantly, but very, I have never had an art teacher here at the middle school and we were able to add an art teacher and um, we'll quickly just show you some pictures. The students are really enjoying art and you can see we have a great deal of talent. The first nine week spotlight is out there in the hallway. And so that's just some sample activities, but we were able to purchase. We had not had an art teacher in over 10 years. We didn't have art supplies. We were able to purchase a kiln and pottery class. So we'll be able to do all kinds of things with our art teachers. So we're very thankful for that. And it's a great way for students to show what they know. Last, we have media arts and we have a media arts class. We were able to add that as well. Um, again, to try to prepare students for the high school and um, the real world. Thank you. Okay, at the high school, we have been real excited about these additional funds and things that we can do with it. Um, one thing that we have done as far as beginning the school, all students receive school supplies. We did not do as much paper and pencil, but more things that um, earbuds, we did mechanical pencils and those things that high school students prefer and usually don't have. When they come back after Christmas, they will receive another book bag with more school supplies to be used for the second semester. Um, we are offering a new course, it's through the CTAE program, it's called um, Bobcat 101, which is a financial literacy class. We're real excited about that to be able to offer this. This course teaches the soft skills that so many people in the job market have requested for us to um, give our kids, how to budget, how credit cards work, how do you interview for a job, those things that many of them don't know when they graduate that we took for granted that they know. Also, we've just recently had someone donated with the Ramsey Education, the curriculum that we were able to use for this program as well. Um, as you know, we are doing some auditorium renovations. A lot of that is with SPLOS, but some of that has been supplemented with the CARES money as well, which in addition to the back of the auditorium is the band room, and we're renovating that with some new um, lockers for the band instruments so that they can be stored and not damaged. Okay, we also offer the after school and Saturday tutoring for um, our students, and this has helped in several ways. We have always had the after school tutoring. This year, we're kind of concentrating some on our athletes. So many of our athletes are struggling as far as trying to be active on the field or the court, as well as the classroom. So we have got um, two teachers who are the athletic tutors that are helping track those students. The coaches are responsible for keeping up with their grades. And if a student drops below 75 and they're an athlete, they are um, required to go to tutoring, which is allowing them to see, first of all, the coach's interest as well as the school's interest in them keeping their grades up as well. Um, we have been able to add a part-time counselor who has been able to do 
some um, grief counseling, which we have really not had the um, staff for during this time. We have a lot of kids at the high school who have lost family members to COVID and other issues. So it's been great for him to be able to do some group counseling with them. We also have a math and a reading interventionist who are working with two programs, Ascend and Achieve 3000, which are two courses that help with math and reading deficiencies in students. We have some students due to, um, as Dr. Culliver said, the year and a half that we've had where we haven't had regular school, they have struggled some. And so we're attempting to kind of bridge that gap. And we have um, changed our curriculum at the high school a little bit. We are now offering geography as a course. And so we were able to order some um, hands-on activities and things, resources for that course. All um, freshmen are now taking the human geography class. And okay, we are oh, working this week to order um, vape detectors. If you watch the news, you know vaping is a um, major problem with teenagers today. We are constantly battling this in the bathrooms at the high school. So we were able to order vape detectors that would be placed in the restrooms that were working in conjunction with our video cameras to try to deter students from vaping, at least at school. Okay, and we were also able to add a shelter. They actually put it up last week. We're real excited about it. It's where we have our picnic tables. A lot of our kids go outside for lunch, which is great because we have an opportunity to be outside and can be a little bit louder because you know, high school students like to be loud. And um, they enjoy going outside and we've incorporated different games. They do connect four, they um, have done giant Jenga. We're doing a giant chess and um, checkers board for them to do outside. And we've incorporated the cornhole, which they really enjoyed. We did the tournament here at homecoming with the cornhole. And um, we started last year a closed closet for students. There are a lot of kids who have a need for clothes, winter jackets. We have given away um, a lot of winter jackets and sweaters. And through Miss Cleaning, she has ordered for us some um, jeans for guys and belts, which most of them need. So that has worked well. And then we have also ordered some feminine hygiene products that are available in all the female bathrooms for them to use. So that has been very helpful and well received. We weren't sure how that was gonna go, but I've been amazed at how appreciative and how um, well the kids have handled all of that. The ESSER funding has been very beneficial in pursuing the district technology initiatives. Uh, as has already been mentioned, the, these funds have been uh, useful in helping us to attain and, their, and subsequently maintain a one-to-one -one computer to student ratio by the purchase of additional Chromebooks and charging cabinets for those Chromebooks. Uh, I'm gonna run through just a handful of things that we've already done with, with this funding. Again, Chromebooks, charging cabinets for those, uh, various accessories that would uh, assist in the utilization of Chromebooks in the classroom and with online testing, uh, some teacher laptops, uh, and the, as mentioned already, uh, vape detectors or environmental sensors. Just a quick side note on that, those are good for more than just detecting uh, vaping. They will detect a, a various other things such as uh, smoke, so from cigarettes, fire detection. Uh, they have noise sensors as well, so potentially gunshot detection, uh, bullying, and various other things like that. So we have that in the works now. Uh, another project that we have currently going is a Wi-Fi upgrade project. We're replacing the entirety of our Wi-Fi network so as to better support all of those Chromebooks and the students' activities on them. Uh, some of the planned activities that we have for that uh, as needed will be more Chromebooks over the next two years. Well, we will have some Chromebooks that will have to rotate out of utilization because of their age. And these funds will be able to replenish that stock, additional charging carts, teacher laptops, uh, interactive flat panels, such as the one that we have here, uh, printers and printing supplies for the, the printed materials that will go with students, document cameras to assist in facilitating both in-class and remote learning as needed, uh, classroom phones, portable battery banks, and a few other things like that. So again, these funds have been very useful in, in helping us to maintain uh, all of our district initiatives. I'm going to be talking about our mental health supports that we've put in place with the CARES money. Based on last year's school counseling and student services referral data, we saw an increase in uh, interper interpersonal conflict, shutting down behaviors, sleeping, retreating from the classrooms, refusal to comply with adult requests, 
frequent trips to the nurse with somatic complaints, sexually inappropriate behaviors, crying, bullying, suicidal and related behaviors, and um, an increase in our referrals to outside agencies, including um, inpatient behavioral health units. So to assist us with meeting the um, social and emotional needs of our students, we were able to add some staff. Ms. Bell already mentioned um, she was able to add a social emotional learning interventionist at the middle school. And she's able to provide one on one support, do group work, provide small group interventions, at, um, as well as um, offer support in the classroom and teacher consultations, staff consultations, um, staffing students, and um, working with parents as well. And as um, Ms. Gilmore mentioned, that they were able to hire a part time school counselor in addition to the two they have as well. Um, and he helps in um, PC students individually and in small groups as well. And at the elementary school, the school counselors there were um, given um, extended day so that during the school day when the students are at school, they're able to spend all of their time providing or most of their, their time providing direct um, services to students. And then they have that extra time at the end of the day to do any documentation that they need to. Um, and then partnering agencies. So um, the next, the first bullet, uh, Dial Care Student Behavioral Health, that's a virtual counseling platform. And this is pending CARES approval. We have it in our budget. Uh, if it gets approved, this is something that we're going to purchase. And it is, um, like I said, a virtual counseling platform where students, um, middle school students and high school students, would have access to a licensed counselor from 7 a.m. to 10 p.m. seven days a week from any device. So they wouldn't even have to be at school. Um, we would, we will um, train students and parents how to utilize the platform. And so they would know how to access it. Um, and it wouldn't, it doesn't go through their insurance or anything like that. This is just a service that we will be able to provide to them. So that's awesome that even on the weekends or um, after school hours, they would still have access to talk to somebody. Um, and then I put Aspire Behavioral Health, that's at no cost to the school, but I did just wanna say that they, we have a therapist um, um, dedicated to serve our, our students that are enrolled in their services and they have an office in all of our buildings. And then United Behavioral Health Solutions, um, we're working on partner partnering with them. Again, no cost to the school system, but, but um, our students will be able to um, access, have access to psychiatric assessment and medication management through um, their telehealth services. Um, and so just some additional things that we were able to do since we did have um, CARES money is flexible seating in our school counselor's offices, um, our group counseling rooms, our counselor suites. Um, if you go to the next slide just for a minute, this is some pictures of some of our uh, flexible seating areas at the elementary school, middle school, and the alternative school. Uh, the kids love this. Like on Wednesdays, I go to the alternative school for group, and they love my room. They just want to come hang. I don't even know the words that they use, but it means cool. I wish I could remember so I could teach y'all. <laughs> but um, they just, they, um, the teachers, they, they ask them like every five minutes, when's the school are going to be here on Wednesday? So um, it's just, it's a fun environment where they can, it's easy, makes it easier for them to be able to relax and I'll just have a change of scenery, take a break. It doesn't look the same as a classroom. And then it makes it a little easier for them to um, open up or participate if they do have something that they're struggling with. So that's been very um, exciting um, getting those, especially when we get a lot of boxes at the central office at one time, because Stella loves that. Um, mobile sensory carts, we go back to it. Um, <clears throat> You'll probably don't know what that is. More to come. Um, this is um, school counselors, myself, and behavior interventionists. Um, 
This will serve as a tool for crisis de-escalation, anxiety re reduction, and um, it'll help with calming strategies. Uh, it took a very long time for them to come in. We ordered them in the spring and they just got here right before fall break. And I'm not letting anybody touch them so I get fully trained on how to use it and then train whoever or the school counselors and the interventionists who are going to be using it. So just stay tuned. Um, we'll make a video and share that whenever we get those up and going. Um, the Counseling Resource Library and School Counseling Resources, we, we were able to get um, books, games, curriculum, sensory tools, fidget items, all kinds of things for. Um, our counseling offices, group rooms, suites. Um, so that's been awesome. Swarm, um, that's just a feature in our infinite campus where staff are able to um, submit concerns to me and the school counselors if, if they have any kind of student concern, regardless of uh, what it's related to. Um, so that makes it easier for us to pull reports and um, identify areas where we're seeing an increase in certain behaviors or academic problems, attendance, and then we know um, kind of where we need to focus our attention. Um, capturing, capturing kids' hearts. Um, this is um, staff development and training that we have in our budget. Um, and this is for teachers and staff to learn how to create a high, high achieving centers of learning by strengthening students' connectedness to others through um, enhancing healthy bonds with their teachers and establishing collaborative agreements of accept acceptable behavior. So really just focusing on um, relationship building and um, that it's supposed to you know, improve the social emotional um, learning environment. And then we put in for professional learning for counselors Wraparound services, I think Ms. Kilgore touched on some. We do, we put in um, a set aside for medical funds um, for students that aren't able to pick up their prescriptions from um, the drugstore because they don't have the funds to do so, or if they need to get um, a hearing evaluation and don't have insurance. It's rare that that that's the case that sometimes um, it does happen and that's a barrier to um, the students learning. So it's nice to be able to have a set aside for that. Same with clothing. We're able to, um, if um, students, if there's a clothing need, we can help them, assist them with getting those or just replenish um, our clothing closets. We do have some form of a clothing closet in almost all of our buildings. Um, we have a set aside for food and then the student laundry room that is pending care's approval as well but the alternative school is hoping to get a laundry room set up for the students to utilize there and um miss kilgore already talked about the feminine um, and personal hygiene items for the students at the high school thank you good evening um some of our funds have been used for the direct replacement of some funds that were cut um, the past couple of years or probably a little bit more than that the state has actually made cuts to some different program areas within ctae that require the staff to spend time outside of the regular school day and so some of the funds that we received were able to make replacement to those funds that were originally cut and so uh, that directly supports the um, you'll see the amounts listed, but the directly supports the programs are FFA, um, FCCLA, FBLA, uh, HOSA, Skills USA, our summer school classes that are including our uh, welding for our occupational safety, which is the intro class for both welding and construction, um, our automotive, as well as our nutrition and foods, uh, the operation of our canning plant as well as um, supervision of those summer programs and our work-based learning. And then the uh, most recent, I guess, and the one that we're most excited about, um, we received $100,000 for an equipment, CTA equipment grant. Um, previously, you're not able to apply for equipment grants for CTAE unless you're having some type of renovation or you're building um, a new area. And so that kind of 
put us in a position where we weren't eligible to apply for equipment grants. And so this particular or these particular funds were allocated for those that have not received uh, equipment grants pretty much within the, the last 10 years and is really more so beneficial for a lot of the, the rural systems that are basically in our position. And so the way that we decided to do it locally is we open it up to all of the CTAE areas. Um, so teachers were able to submit their needs, um, but there was a preference for the healthcare programs as well as the nutrition and food science programs, because these were the only two um, that had really received any kind of equipment updates within the last few years. Um, previously, we've received grants from different areas that have allowed us to make purchases for different other program areas. So. I have a list here of the items that we will be used um, that will be purchased with the equipment grant. So um, for agriculture, the, the indoor walk-in cooler with the increasement of the activities that we're doing in the, the cannon plant, it allows us to have a, a industry cooler so that they won't have to make trips uh, like two and three trips throughout the summer to go pick up loads of peas and that kind of thing. So they have more space for storage. Um, for healthcare, trying to modernize a little bit more of the equipment. Because we have a CNA program, they still have to do things and learn things the old fashioned way as far as like monitoring blood pressure and that sort of type of thing. So they still need experience with those industry tools that they would see like in the hospital. So um, allowing us to buy more um, digital items as well as some uh, washer and dryer they've been having to kind of share with the nutrition and foods program. Um, and a patient simulator, one of the ones that actually um, you can program different um, scenarios and then the students have to figure out what's going on with the patient. Patient makes noise, it's kind of weird, but um, <laughs> I think they'll find it exciting. Um, and for nutrition and foods, um, most of the items that we have there as far as like we have some original double wall ovens and an original cooktop that was there when the, 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 the program was actually erected. So. Um, we're going to be replacing those as well as replacing the range ovens, uh, microwaves, dishwashers, refrigerators, um, the washer and dryer that we currently have, some of the mixers. We'll have a, a new mobile demonstration center that includes a sink and a cooktop. And then some of the other items that are listed, it might kind of sound kind of weird for nutrition and foods, but we do have a nutrition through the lifespan class where they learn about nutrition through different aspects of the life, life um lifespan so that will include some um, different models and some simulation suits and some simulators as far as like alcohol and, and drugs Thank you. the early county program for exceptional children or as most people know it as the special education department um, is funded through ida 611 and 619 this year we were able to get additional funding through the american rescue plan for funds the bulk of our budget is used to cover the salaries and benefits of our paraprofessionals and our special education um, um, secretary there. Um, we do have funds for a pre-K special education teacher who services, uh, provides services for our pre-K students as well as our local Head Start. Um, part of our funding, we are required to set aside a, a certain amount of money for proportionate share and those are for services that we provide to our private school here and they have requested speech services. So we do provide those services. We have SLPs that go out there. Um, this year, we were able to bring back a parent mentor. I think it's been maybe six years since we've had one in place. Um, we do get a grant from the state for our parent mentor. However, we have to pay the additional funding to cover those costs. Um, she's come in this year and she's done a wonderful job for us throughout the system. Um, we also use our funds to cover our contract to service providers. That's our occupational therapists, physical therapists, our deaf, hard of hearing teacher, as well as our visually impaired teacher. Our numbers are small in those areas, so we contract out there. Um, our budget does include travel dues and fees um, for a local organization and for travel to conferences. Um, our system is currently still disproportionate in the number of African-American students identified as having an intellectual disability. Because of that, we have to develop a comprehensive coordinated early intervening services plan each year. Um, part of our funds are used to help with our district and our elementary school MTSS coordinators who help with the implement development and implementation of that plan. Um, the focus of that plan is reading. We're focusing on reading in K through three. Um, but across the board, as they've said, we do see reading as an issue. So this year we were able to bring in a special education interventionist who worked solely with students with disabilities on reading in kindergarten through fifth grade. 
Um, we do have extended day services being provided at the middle school and high school to provide additional services. Um, this year, due to we are short staffed with special education teachers and the overall workload of our teachers, we did implement a special education retention supplement this year that we're hoping to be able to maintain um, moving forward. Um, additional resources that our department has been able to um, obtain through additional funds, we were able to, for our small group or our self-contained classrooms, we have a curriculum we use into why we're able to purchase that for those classes, as well as outdoor learning areas, which are picnic tables and shelters at all three schools. Um, we were able to purchase classroom resources and supplies at all of the schools to enhance learning, whether that was instructional or sensory items. Um, in our more severe classes, we were able to purchase additional masks, gloves, plastic aprons, and plastic glass partitions. Um, Goal Book, we work with Goal Book to help and increase our um, efficiency in developing our IEPs. And before the district got a teacher paid teacher um, license, we also had one for just the special education department. I think that's it. Um, throughout our school year, we do have additional funds that we are able to purchase, purchase additional resources and supplies for students and teachers as they need them. Um, as part of our latest, the latest amendment, we did ask and we're hoping that we are able to get in a sensory room at the elementary school. We have students over there with various disabilities um, and we're trying to be able to work with them to find ways for them to find the balance between school. Um, so we're hoping that will be something that we'll be able to implement in the near future. Okay, I'm gonna um, stop sharing there for just a minute. And, um, oh. Oh, I'm sorry. Let's see. Here we go. Um, I want to. Um, so, as you've heard from our admin team, um, we've we've utilized the funds from ESSER in a variety of different ways. So, we're going to. Um, we wanted to let you know what we've been doing with the funding. We also wanna let you know how you can um, provide your input into the funding um, and how we spend the funds. Is correct, Dr. Brown? So I want to um, let you bear with me just one second. <laughs> and let me uh, share my screen again. Um, all right, let me see here. So if you go to our website, um, which is early.k12.ga.us, um, you can, this is what it looks like. And you can see um, down here, we, we have the school reopening plan. Um, it, the current version will always be posted there. You can always go there to find it. Um, and then you see um, our American Rescue Plan application. So ESSER, as uh, Ms. Smith said, we had three rounds. ARP is the third round of that funding. And this is the application we've made for it. And by the way, we're still waiting on our budget approval for ARP. So um, that's where we're at with that. And then this is the link that you can go to to um, give us some feedback. Or if you have a question, um, you can go to this link and it'll take you to this form. And you can put your information in and ask your question. If the form, there we go. Um, and then we will get back with you. So um, just uh, wanted to make sure you know where you can go to provide that feedback. Um, and all right, so our um, let's go back to our video. I'm gonna stop share and then share again. And I'm gonna go ahead. Uh, Craig Story is our athletic director and he's going to talk about um, the high school classification, which is not about ESSER, but it is about something I think that our community wants to know about. So uh, we'll start with that. I'm gonna go back to sharing my screen and we will hear from him. All right. Hello, I'm here today to talk to you about the 
GHSA reclassification process that the high school is currently in. But first, I'd like to give you a little background information. The GHSA, or the Georgia High School Association, is an association of high schools in Georgia that got together for the basis of forming state championships in various athletic and academic events. The GHSA is divided into seven classes, one through seven, one being the smallest, seven being the largest. At this time, we are in region one, two A, which means we're in the double A in the second from the bottom classification. Now, each classification has seven to eight regions. Now, those regions are divided by demographic and geography. In other words, they try to put you as close to other schools in your area in your classification as they can. These regions are determined by what is called the FTE count, which is basically a count of the number of students that you have in your school. There's also what is called a multiplier. Each out of county student in your district or out of district student counts three. We currently have 41 out of district students. So they multiply the 41 by three and add those into our total. We feel at this time we will be moving down the classification from two to 1A, and we will be in region one of single A. So you will hear it referred to as region one A or region one single A. Now, unlike other classifications, single A regions have public versus private schools because there are a large number of private single A schools in the state. When you reach the playoffs, they then divide those teams into a private section and a public section. So when we get to the playoffs, we should only be playing public schools. But at this time, that is on hold because there is a, another meeting coming up from the Georgia High School Association that want, some people want to change it. And it's created basically an uproar in the whole state. So right now we still, I'm saying we think we're going to do all this because we actually don't know until after this next meeting. But what does this mean for early county? What this means for early county is in all of our athletics, we will have some renewed region rivalries. We will be playing Miller County, Seminole, people in our area that most people will know someone that goes to that school type stuff. And we just think it's going to be really good for having those rivalries and an increase in revenue because we feel like somebody from Seminole County is going to come up here to a game a lot easier than say Berrien County or Fitzgerald. It also makes it easier on our coaches to schedule games. Instead of having to hunt someone to play, we have many, many more teams in our region and that way we have less games that we have to schedule that are non-region, which are usually the hardest ones to schedule. Uh, it also for us means less travel. At this time, we travel around 99 miles as an average to region games because we have to go to Berrien County, Fitzgerald, Thomasville, etc. When we move to region 1A, our average travel time is going to drop to 33 miles. This is going to be a great savings for our school system. But the most important thing, and we think is what is really going to help our students, is less class time loss for travel. For instance, when we go to Fitzgerald, our students have to get out of class between 1 and 1.30 to make most of their games. Now we'll be looking at 30 minutes and possibly not even have to get out of class. So that increase of class time or increase in less class time will be awesome. Uh, if you would like to see any more information on this, first of all, you can call me and I'll try to help you. Or you can get on the internet and look at www.ghsa.net and it has links and uh, places that you can look. Thank you.
All right, so I just kind of want to give a little bit of information to thank you all again for, for being here, for listening. As you can tell, if you are listening to all of our principals and directors, um, our students have a lot of needs, and we all know, and everybody's been personally uh, touched by the, you know, the tragedy of the pandemic, and so we're trying to provide every resource, both academically, social, emotional, and in every sort of way to, to help students get back to what I guess will be the new normal and help them be more successful. So let's just talk a little bit why, about school funding and some of our building initiatives. So schools are funded from three different sources, federal funds, state funds, and local funds. So federal funds are things like Title I, Title II, you hear us there. The, we have other meetings to, dis, to, to discuss those, but um, they have various re, uh, purposes, like if they're for academic achievement or for teacher improvement or things like that. So that's the case for another meeting. The purpose of this meeting is to give you information on those ESSER funds, which is a federal grant as well. So also we have local funds, but the bulk of our funding comes from state funds. And if you can look at this little chart right here, just since we're kind of talking, the whole point of this meeting is for, from ESSER, which was as a result of COVID-19. So really just talk, talking about fiscal year 19, or 2020. And when we talk fiscal years, is basically like the year that the school year ends in. So fiscal year 20 was the 1920 school year. So for every year since 2020, you can see we've lost money. So we've lost a total of $2 million roughly in two years. And if you look over on the right side of that, we have sustained that loss without raising the millage rate. And the millage rate is basically your local property taxes. So we have not raised property taxes and, and sustained that $2 million loss. Now, some of that loss is sustained through the fact that we have a declining population in our community, but other times has been sustained just through um, attrition or through people retiring and maybe not filling their position, but dispersing their duties to someone else. All right, so um, the other part is local funds. We'll talk a little bit about that um, some more. Okay, so if you'll go to the next slide. Education is one of our civic duties as a citizen. If you look at that quote on the top of that slide, from the beginning of the United States of America, John Adams, who was our second president, said the whole people must take upon themselves the education of the whole people and be willing to bear the expense of it. So the cost of educating a child in Georgia from grades kindergarten through 12th grade is roughly $110,000. Of that, because I said the bulk of our funding comes from state, the state gives us about 71,500 over the course of those 13 years. So that leaves close to $39,000 that the local citizens are responsible for paying for the education of that citizen. So, you know, you have a lot of people who say, oh, I don't have any children, or I moved here after my children were grown, or my children don't go to public school, but it's our, responsibility as citizens to educate our community and our citizens because the value of an educated community is priceless. And somebody gave me this example and I love it. You know, the I haven't used the fire department. Thank goodness. I hope I never have to use the fire department or call them. But I don't want them not to be funded. I don't want to say, oh, I've never called the fire department. Why do I have to pay my, ta why do my taxes have to go to the fire department? I'm still willing to fund that because that is one of my requirements as a citizen of Arlington County as well. So we're all in this together, just like our vision says, where everyone's committed to student success. So if you go to the next slide, one of the ways to, I guess, uh, spread the local funding burden among all of the citizens is to continue to pass ESPLOST. And ESPLOST stands for Education, Special Purpose, Local Option Sales Tax. So that like in early county, the county has one for the county commissioners for different projects like road pavings and bridge uh, repairs and things like that. And we have one for the school system also as an extra 1% sales tax on anything you buy in early county. 
So there are some things that East Blost can pay for and some of the things that it cannot pay for. And a lot of times people don't know this. They just think that you can, the school system can use whatever money they have for whatever reason. And that's not the case because of the purpose of the funds with, with which we're given. All right, so like for example, East Blast cannot be used to pay for utilities or salaries or benefits. It can be paid, it can be used to pay for and has been used to pay for things like books or computers. Um, it paid for the new gym which is not really new anymore, even though it'll probably be the new gym for a long time, but it's about 10 years old now. And it's also paying for the bulk of the auditorium renovations as well. So our voters will hopefully continue to support our East Bloss because it's one way that everybody contributes to the local portion of educating our citizens. The next time it'll be up on the ballot for election is in November of 2022. And you'll be hearing some more about that in the coming months. All right, um, in early 2020, our school systems facility plan was reviewed by a committee that consisted of a, the superintendent, the facilities director, a facilities person from the Georgia Department of Education, and then several other local school district members from our surrounding area. Their recommendations included a lot of renovations to all of the buildings in our school system. And they also instructed us to explore the possibility of a new high school. In our last East Blast, which is actually that we're still in, because I said, remember that the vote is next November. So in this East Blast, uh, we had set aside or said that we were gonna, gonna try to save a million dollars to plan for a new high school. Now, when you pass and you put an East Gloss before the voters, we gave you a list and it's periodically in the paper of the things that we say we're gonna use, like how much money we're gonna spend on technology and how much money we're gonna spend on books and things like that. In that, that's just a projected because obviously you can't tell how much money or how much sales you're gonna have in the county for five years. So of that million dollars that looks like on paper, we said we have to plan for a new high school, that money did not get collected. You know, you can't collect what didn't sell. So we said we were gonna start this, but we have not had the funds available to do that to this point. So um, that's just a little bit more about SPLOST. So a little bit more about facilities. So if we think about facilities plan and our SPLOST and things like that. According to the Georgia Department of Education, the life cycle of a school building is 40 years. And then after that, you really have it almost costs more money to keep it going than it would be to you know, look at other options. So if you think about that, our high school is 58 years old. So it's getting close to half another life cycle of a building. So I think we as early county citizens have done a fabulous job of keeping the high school in as good a shape as it's in, which is not real good shape right now. There's a lot of issues with it, but I think we've done a really good job to keep that in, even though it's past its life cycle. So we consider the elementary school and middle school fairly new, or at least older people like me anyway, but the, middle, the elementary school is 28 years old and the middle school is 25 years old. So just like, you know, 30 years ago, when our community really rallied together and said, okay, we need new facilities for our students to be educated in, those buildings are over half of their life cycle now. So there are things that are going to need to begin to renovations that need to happen there also. So we're currently exploring various options to make sure that our students are educated in up-to-date facilities. We want our children educated in an up-to-date facility. We want our grandchildren educated in up-to-date facilities. It matters to us. It should matter to you, I hope also. We do have a declining population. However, you don't want to limit yourselves and not a, be able to allow for any growth in the future. And I say that in reference to, if you think about several school systems around us, like Calhoun, uh, Cowan County, Baker County, I think Seminole County is about, they're, they're building, building those K-12 schools where the whole school is in one building. And that probably sounds financially feasible, 
but we don't want to do that if that's going to to lock us in where we, you know, people move back from the urban areas into the rural areas where we don't have any room or expansion for growth. Also, our elementary and middle schools still have plenty of, you know, they have life left in them. Okay, so one of those options then is thinking about the ABAC campus out on the bypass. The Board of Regents across the state of Georgia is in the process of deciding what to do with the different satellite campuses of, that have closed of all the colleges around. And so the school system is hoping to attain the Blakely ABAC campus so that we have options in case groups of our students are displaced due to renovations or if there's new construction or whatever, like there's a possibility as we work on our buildings that you know one hall may not be able to be used or we want to have somewhere for those kids to go. So we think that that ABAC campus would be a great, a great spot because that's already set up for educational purposes. Uh, down the road, it could even have some potential for other for other uses, maybe even possibly a revenue making reason and like maybe rent out as office space or something like that. So we don't even know that we're gonna be able to acquire it, but we do hope so. And we are talking with the Board of Regents and trying to get that worked out. So all of this to say us a lot of stuff and nothing really definite yet because we're all kind of in the, in the phase, in the, planning phase and the talking about it and what's good and what's not and what what do these people want what do those people want but I went to the high school as a teacher in 1994 and so probably for at least about 15 years we've been dealing with issues at the high school it smells like sewage sometimes sometimes you go and there's like muddy water coming up in the janitor's closet the roof has been patched and done stuff with more times than not so it's kind of like this big elephant that we've been dragging around by the leash and we've been carrying it from corner to corner of the room and it's really time to deal with it because if we don't deal with the issues at the high school, the high school is long past its life cycle as a school building, then we're going to end up having to do something with all three buildings as the elementary and middle school are close to the same age, they will begin to age out also. So just like you know, you know, the old saying, how do you eat an elephant one bite at a time. Well, I'm here to say that it's time to take the first bite. It's time to quit dragging around and saying, oh, we need to do something about the high school, but I don't want to deal with it. So let's just wait a little bit. Let's patch this. Let's patch this. So anyway, I encourage your and appreciate your input. Um, I point you back to where Miss Tammy's story suggested that you give feedback, ask questions, things like that. We like for that to be done electronically so that we can direct it then to the proper person who can get you the best, most accurate answer. So I appreciate your attendance this evening and thank you for your support. And thank you for being committed to the success of all students in Early County.